record this on my computer. And I'm also going to share my screen. And I'm narrating because this is what I do. Um, okay. So I'm really excited about today. We are going to do a little bit of a review because um, what we've been discussing is pretty big. You know, <clears throat> excuse me, the purpose of life is a pretty big question. It's, it's a pretty big topic. And so we are always going to um, go back to, um, hi, I'm so happy you're here, Katie. Hi. Hi. Um, we are, we are going to be going back and forth between different scriptures because we need to keep revisiting the truth, right? And so some of the ways that we can remember uh, certain things is by um, going back to it, right? Uh, calling back to it, reading the scriptures over and over. Um, it's funny because my oldest son is reading uh, through the Bible on his own. Um, we do family devotion, but he has his own devotion time. And um, he just finished Revelation and I told him to start in a different book. And he was like, but I just read the last book of the Bible. And I said, welcome to being a Christian, buddy. You got to keep going, go back to something else. It was very, very cute. And just a lesson that we're not going to know everything. And if you've never read a Bible before, it's totally, it's totally okay. We have to be okay with being a beginner. And this is what, you know, hopefully this lesson will teach us. Um is that we, there's always more to learn. There's always more to learn. And I love um, the Bible. I love teaching the Bible um, because the Lord has just been so amazing. And so if you are just joining, I am JC and I um, am an author, artist, all the things. Hi, Kristen. Um, so I am so excited to bring you guys this Purpose of Life study. So we are going to be doing Instagram live and also zoom if you're just joining us um, and I'm recording the zoom for later. So I'm going to be talking between two different screens, but I think it's going to work cool. Uh, be cool tonight. So if you have your Bibles, um, that's great. Uh, if you have your Bible apps, that's fine. Um, like I said, you don't have to, I will give you the scriptures that you can write down and revisit later. Um, but um, we are going to be in Genesis 2 for most of this. Um, hey, Jessica. Hey, everybody. Come on in. So let's talk about the purpose, right? Purpose of life. We have purpose of God. We also have purpose of mankind. I spoke about this once before. Um, and so we are going to be revisiting some of the topics um, that we were talking about the last couple of weeks. Um, the purpose of God a lot of people are curious about, obviously, it's a very, very big thing. It is to be known. It's so simple. God wants to be known. He wants a relationship with us. And one of the first lessons that we talked about in the Purpose of Life study is how our God is a creator. He's also our father. He didn't just want to create us and then not worry about us anymore. He wanted that intimate relationship with us because he is a father. He is an intimate uh, you know, a uh, uh, heart. He has an intimate heart. He and that's and that's why we want to connect with each other, right? If we are made in God's image, and and we are made in the image of our Father, we also want to connect in relationships. We want to be known, and so the purpose of God is to be known, to have a relationship with us. Okay, and so I'm going to uh, take us to Isaiah 43, 10 and eleven. Again, we are revisiting some scriptures that we did last time. So you can write that down, Isaiah 43, 10, and 11. And if you are on Zoom, I'm going to uh, show it up, right up, show it up, uh, pop, it, pop it right up right now. Um, Isaiah is such an awesome book because you just get such a rich um, look into who God is. Because a lot of, a lot of us, and a lot of people in the world who are confused about Christianity, who are confused about the Bible, they don't think God can be known. But that's not true. God can be known to the finite minds of men. That's what my bishop, you know, has always said, is that God can make himself known. He has all power. Why can't he show himself and reveal himself to us? He can do that. And he has in his word. So in Isaiah 43... 10 and 11, it says this, 
Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall be shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. There's so much there. God is saying, I am. I am the Lord, and there's no Savior besides me. He's making it very clear. He wants to be known, and he's saying, you are my witnesses. You are my witnesses because you have seen who I am. And he's saying, I have chosen whom I have chosen, right? And now he's talking to Isaiah here, but uh, this is also a promise to all of us is that we are chosen and God wants to be known to each and every one of us. And so if you think that God doesn't care about you and that God doesn't know where you are, that's a lie. That's a lie trying to keep you away from knowing who God is. Because once you know who God is, then you have power to overcome anything that comes up against you. And when you have the power to overcome anything that comes up against you, you also have power over the dark forces in this world, the spiritual wickedness that, you know, is is in the unseen places. And we will talk about that later on in the purpose of life study. But right now, God is staying, saying that, you know, I've chosen you that you may know and believe me that I am he and understand that I am he. He doesn't just want to be known, but he wants to be understood. How do we do that? We spend time with him. When you have a relationship with someone, you know their name. That's great. But you don't get to have that deep relationship with them them until you understand who they are, even in friendships, right? Even with people that you may have known for a long time. A lot of us are friends with with a, a, a lot of people on Facebook that we don't actually know, right? <laughs> like we know their name. Uh, we have little understanding about their life. We have a limited connection with them, um, but we don't understand who they are. Uh, and, and it's just natural part of life, nothing to be ashamed about. Uh, but God is saying he doesn't want that relationship with us. He wants to be known. He wants to be understood. And he's going to tell us, he says, before me, there is no God form. There's no God before him. And then he says, neither shall there be after me. How amazing is that? He's saying, I want you to know me. I want you to understand who I am. So here it is. Here is my essence here is my just uh, uh, identity right that there is no other god formed neither shall you know before or after me and we know obviously in scripture we'll get into that that jesus is the first and the last he is the only god when there's one god there's only one on the throne there's nobody else sharing his glory or his power which is why in isaiah 43 11, he continues and he says, I, even I am the Lord and beside me, there is no savior. God wants us to be reminded that nobody else can save you. So when we think about the purpose of life, because remember this whole Bible study is about the purpose of life. No other God, no other person can save us like the Lord Jesus Christ, because no other God exists and no other person can fulfill you the way that God can fulfill us. And so the purpose of God to be known, to have that relationship with us is to let us know that he knows our hearts. And we're going to talk about that today. Now, when you think about the purpose of mankind, it's to know God. It seems so simple, but sometimes we complicate the, you know, uncomplicated because it's easy to get distracted. What's our purpose in life, God? Where do, what am I meant to do? Where am I meant to go? You know, what's the plan of it all? And God does have a plan and he does know all the intimate details uh, that you question. He knows every answer to that. But the main purpose of mankind, mankind meaning men and women, all humans, is to know God. Remember, God's main purpose is to be known, to have that relationship with us. So we need to also give it back. We need to be givers. 
receivers and givers back and forth, just like a regular relationship. So we need to know God, to have a relationship with God, which can be very difficult because it's like, where do we start? Well, you're starting right now. So praise the Lord. You're starting it right now, just by learning, just by actually entertaining the thought that there is a God who loves you and that there is a God who is real and that he's available. You're starting that now. So it's easy to get discouraged and it's easy to get overwhelmed. And I want to just call out discouragement and overwhelm right now and and rebuke it in the name of Jesus. It is not welcome here because if we are following after God, we have hope and we have love and we have light. And so anything else that comes against us Uh, that's going to discourage us. Uh, We need to just uh, put our blinders on and focus on the good. So I'm going to take us to Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. So if you have your notebooks and you don't have your Bible, it's fine. You can just write that down. And if you're on Zoom, I've highlighted it here. Obviously, it's a very powerful scripture for those of us who um, have studied the word on our own. Um, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy I didn't want to do it this week, and I told her I didn't want to, and she asked me if I wanted to do it. Oh, and, okay. Yeah. Um, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Um, Hold on one second. Um, So our purpose, obviously, is to know him. And... How do we do that? Well, God's telling us that we need to love the Lord, thy God. That means our God. We need to make him our God, which is very difficult to do. And I understand that Um, with all of our heart. And that's going to take some time. And right now we're just asking God to just show us, just teach us. And God, we don't know everything. You're God. And if you are real, then show me, right? And I think that's just um, a natural uh, way to study and to learn the Bible and to learn um, who God is, is just to be honest and just say, listen, I don't know anything. Um, I'm new at this. I probably am not used to reading the Bible ever. And so help me out. And I just want to learn so that I could be a better person And um, that hopefully I can feel some hope and joy more than than I've already felt. And I know that there's more out there for me, but I'm not exactly sure uh, what it is. Um, Remember, we're talking about the purpose of life. And I think we need to just be real with ourselves and be, be real with God because he knows everything. So God who formed the world has made it possible for us to not only connect with him, but also to commune with him to spend time with him, to communicate with him. And we were created very carefully and with purpose. We talked about this in, um, I think it was part two, maybe part one, part two, but we are not created by accident. No matter what anyone says, if you just look at how we were made and how we were, how we communicate with each other and how we interact with each other and even just how nature works, how everything is a beautiful system that kind of balances each other out, everything was created with a purpose. We were created carefully. And so our existence uh, was calculated. Nothing is done by accident. And everything has a purpose. Whether we know that or not, everything does have a purpose. And so I want to go tonight to Genesis chapter 2, verses eight and nine. So if you have your Bibles, um, you can turn there. If you have your notebooks, just write it down or you can just listen and, and go there later. But 
if you're on Zoom, I'm going to pull this up now. Genesis 2, verses 8 and 9. And I'm going to read it to you, if you don't mind. <laughs> it says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So in part one and part two of the Bible study, um, which I have on YouTube, if you search Hello Awesome on YouTube, you'll find the replay. Uh, we talked about how God created man, how he breathed the breath of life into man, the purpose of uh, man and how uh, we are to be the clay and he is to be our potter. So, so I really encourage you to revisit um, those. Uh, I think after this, I can put the link to my YouTube channel inside uh, my stories. If you want a clickable link, um, you can also head to the link in my bio if you are on Instagram um, and it's on there. Just trying to keep it safe, um, safe, <laughs> easy. Um so out of the ground, may the Lord grow God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Okay, so I want to make sure we highlight that part, that God is our provider and he gave everything, everything that man needed in the garden of Eden, he gave it to him. He didn't uh, keep anything from him. And a lot of times people think that God's keeping good stuff from us because he's trying to you know, teach us a lesson and whatnot. And maybe that's true, but God doesn't keep things that we need away from us. He's always our provider. He will not keep anything that you need away from you. He might keep things that you want away from you. And that's a totally different thing. But our God is our creator and he's our, he's our father. He's also our provider, right? So he gave everything that man needed in the garden and God put two trees in the middle of the garden, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil in plain sight for man to see. It was a choice between good and not good. But why would God do that? The big question, remember this Bible study is about the purpose of life. That's a big question. Why would God do that? Well, the easy answer is free, freedom of choice right? Uh, choose between our will or God's will. Okay. We don't like that. Uh, we don't, we like it in a sense that if we uh, have that freedom of choice, we can do what we want to do, but we don't like the idea of this test, right? This temptation. Um, and God didn't do it out of spite or hatred or because he's a bigot or any of that nonsense. God is good and he's merciful just like a parent just like a father and he didn't create us to be slaves without free will he wants us to freely seek after him to freely know him to choose with our own hearts to follow him because that dedication makes the relationship richer if you were in a relationship and somebody forced you to love them you're going to be resentful you're going to be bitter you're probably going to have hatred in your heart God is not uh, um, an unkind master. Uh, oh, he is a loving father. And we're going to go to um, a couple of different scriptures in the New Testament uh, to talk a little bit about this. Uh, I'm going to go to Romans 12, 2. And so I'm going to uh, pull that up here on Zoom. And I believe I share these scriptures last week, but they are always good to revisit. Like I said, helps us to remember and to learn. So Romans 12, 2 says this, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay, so this is a commandment that, that you know, um, that was being preached in the New Testament 
don't be conformed to this world, <clears throat> to what you see, to the love maybe that you've seen, to the way relationships are in the world, to how people treat each other, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So when you become in a relationship with God, he's going to renew your mind. Your thoughts are going to be different than how they were before. And you're not going to think the same. You're not going to feel the same because you know a little bit more than you did before, if that makes sense. And so um, when we have a renewed mind, it's going to prove, you know, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, okay? We are not good and acceptable and perfect on our own. None of us are, but it's possible. When we follow the will of God, then goodness and acceptability and perfection and all that can be achieved, if not in this life, then in the next life to come, um, which we're not going to get deep into that. But next time, um, so let's move on. Next scripture um, is in First John 2, 15 through 17. So... Um, always have a hard time narrowing down scripture because I want to say it all. Um, let me know if you guys can hear me on Instagram because I'm speaking into this mic on Zoom. Um, I want to make sure that <clears throat> I could be heard. Um, okay, so First John 2, 15 through 17 says this. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Now, the world is anything outside of the will of God. Any person, any uh, motive, any plan. Thanks, Katie. Um, that's outside of the will of God. That's outside of where God wants to keep you. Okay, so the world, if we're thinking about Adam and Eve, the world would be outside of the garden. And now we get a relationship with the Lord. That he's trying to bring us back to that garden relationship um, that, that Adam and Eve kind of messed up for us. And we're going to get into that a little bit later, but not, not quite. We'll probably get into it next week a little bit more. But anyways, <clears throat> love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now that's a promise. That's a promise. That if we follow what God has asked us to do, his will, then we don't have to worry about the life to come or even death or any of those things that we can abide forever. And that's going to be something we'll talk about when we get into um, salvation later on, you know, the purpose of life. So I want to talk about how the Lord looks at our hearts. And I'm going to take us to first Samuel 16, seven, which is a very important scripture because it actually says, that the Lord looketh on the heart. And I'm not going to get deep into the story there because I love it so very much. Um, I've studied it um, many times in 1 Samuel 16, 7. Now my youngest is named Samuel. And that was partly because I was studying this so much and the Lord placed it on my heart that it would be uh, my son's name. But this is when, <clears throat> okay, they were trying to, the prophet Samuel was going to anoint the next king. And he was told by the Lord to go see Jesse, a man named Jesse and his sons, and to anoint one of the sons as king and he will tell the Lord will tell Samuel which one it was. Well, all of Jesse's children were there. So they thought and 
um, they were looking at each one. Samuel was looking at each one. And the Lord tells Samuel this. He says this. But the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So if you don't like the way you look on the outside, don't worry. God loves your heart. But if you don't like the way you look on the outside, don't worry because God made you and he created you. and He has a purpose and nothing was made by accident. And God loves the way that you look, even if you don't love the way that you look. And that's just a sidebar. It's something that I talk about actually intensely in my book, Give It to God, Girl. Um, but anyways, I'm not going to plug that <clears throat> anymore. But this was because, <clears throat> excuse me. This was because one of Jesse's sons looked strong. And he said, surely the Lord's anointing is on this boy. But the Lord said, no. And the Lord told Samuel, don't look on the outside. Don't look at this, this boy just because he looks strong. It does not mean that I have anointed him. And so there's a lot of people out there who look very strong on the outside. But God is looking at our hearts. What are you doing with your heart on the inside? The choices that you're making, how are you using the free will that God has given you, right? God sees what is inside of us. Remember, his purpose is to be known to our hearts. And so God is going to look at it, look at our hearts and see how we are using our free will. If we're using it to learn more about him or if we're using it to do things that are against what he wants us to do. And that's not because he doesn't want us to have uh, freedom and desires and happiness. It's because he wants us to experience true love, true agape love. Agape love is a godly love, a love that we cannot get anywhere else but from God. And I'm going to bring us to some scriptures here. And this is going to be rapid fire uh, because I'm conscious of our time. Um, so I'm going to say what the scriptures are. I will read them, but you can write them down and you can look at them later in your Bibles if you would like. I do encourage you to do that. Um, it's something that I um, really learned to do, especially when I was first starting to learn uh, the Bible is just actually rereading scripture and writing it down and reading it as I wrote it. It helped with my memory. Now, I am not someone who can come up with scriptures off the top of my head usually, um, but I do, uh, it has helped with, hey, there is a scripture somewhere that says this and it has like a little part of it and then I kind of can search and find it. But anyway, so Psalm 37, four says this, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee, that means give you, the desires of your heart. If you want to be married, God knows that. If you want to have kids, God knows that. If you want a good job, God knows that. If you want a better home life, if you want a better family life, if you want just to be better, if you want to move. God knows all of those things. But we have to delight in the Lord. We have to have that relationship with him. It's just like when we're in a relationship with somebody else and we will get the desires of our hearts that align with his will. Because when we are in a relationship with God, what we want will start to change. Because we're not just thinking about what we want. We're also thinking about what what we want so that it's pleasing to the one who loves us. Does that make sense? Um, so let's go to Psalms 44, 20 and 21. It says this, if we have forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands to a strange God, shall not God search this out? for he knoweth the secrets of the heart. Okay, so what the scripture is saying is, have we forgotten who God is and 
it, or, or have we stretched our hands, reached or worshiped a strange God? Um, just something else that's opposite of God who actually can't really save us, but just makes us feel good. It says, shall not God search this out? Doesn't he know that about us already? If he knows what our idols are, who we have placed in his, in his spot, in our hearts. It says, for he knoweth the secrets of the heart. Now, all of us, if we were to wear the secrets of our heart on our skin, we would be mortified. We would not want anybody to see the secrets of our hearts. I do not want you to see some of the secrets that I've had I've had in my heart that the Lord has helped me repent from. Even some of the secrets in my heart that I had just this morning. Okay, let's just be real. I don't want any of you guys to see that. And you don't want me to see your secrets of your heart. We think that we can keep it shut away so God doesn't see it. But God sees all things, not because he wants to use it against us in a mean and cruel way. It's because he wants to clean us so that we can experience a new mind, a new heart, a new life. The purpose of life is to know him because he is love, right? And he searches our hearts, not because, like I said, he wants to use those secrets against us like a, you know, a meddling, gossiping friend. No, he's saying, here's what I know is inside of your heart. He's going to present it to you. And he's going to ask you to turn away from it, which is called repentance, and say, maybe you should reconsider what you have here. All right. So next scripture is Proverbs 28, 26. And I'm going to pull it up here on Zoom. It says this. It's kind of a warning, but also a promise. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. Remember, we can't really trust what's inside of our hearts because sometimes what we want is not actually what we need. And that's kind of, you know, the whole point of this purpose of life and all the big questions of life is what do we want and what do we need? Now, when we know God, he will help us with those decisions. Let's go to Jeremiah 17, 9. And this is going to be a pretty big scripture. I've said this before in a, another lesson. It was so true. And in Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it? Well, we know who can know it. God just says that he sees the secrets of your heart. So this is kind of a rhetorical question, right? Because if you look at 10, uh, Jeremiah seventeen ten, it says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. That means what you put inside your heart you're going to get out. And what you put inside your heart and what you act on, you are going to receive back usually from other people. Now, there are a lot of people who put good things in their heart and re they receive negative in return. That's not necessarily because you have entertained negative in your own life. That means they also have free choice. And we'll talk about this later on to do even hurtful things which is very hard and difficult uh, for us to deal with in life. But we'll get into that. And then we're going to go to 1 John 3, um, 21. Back to the New Testament. And I didn't want to, I have a lot of jumping around now, but, but we won't be jumping around too much after this. 1 John 3, 21 says, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we then have we confidence towards God. Okay. Um, so one of the big questions that we have when we talk about the purpose of life is why do bad things happen to good people? Or why didn't God step in? 
Now, there's a lot of tragedies right now in the world. We have obviously some uh, weather tragedies. Um, there's also just some cultural and social tragedies that are happening all over the world, especially in our nation right now. And we have this question, why do bad things happen to good people? And it is a legit question. And I'm going to try and answer that here, but it's not a simple answer because it's a very heavy question. We want God to come in and we want God to just take over and we want God to heal and do miracles. And he does those things. He does those things. But we have to remind ourselves that there are always a, there, there's always good choices that are available, but we don't always make good choice, which is very hard to swallow. And I'm going to go to these scriptures um, as proof of that. Psalms 81, 10 through 12. Okay, so God is talking about the children of Israel. We haven't gotten to that part yet of the study, but there is a, a group of God's people that um, were not obedient and did not follow his will consistently in the scripture, even though God actually did perform a miracle and he sent Moses to um, save the Israelites from Egypt from being slaves. And they turned around and thanked him by being disobedient. Just like a child does to a parent sometimes, unfortunately. But in here, Psalms 81, 10, he says, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And he's talking to uh, the Israelites. Open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. He's saying, be open to me. Hey, Theo, be open to me. Open my open your mouth and I'm going to fill it. I'm going to give you what you need. But in Psalms 81, 11, it says, but my people would not hearken to my voice. They wouldn't listen to me. And Israel would none of me. So one of the reasons why bad things happen to good people is usually the people who are doing the wrong are not obeying the Lord and they're not in God's will. And so whatever they have put in their hearts, remember we're talking about about our hearts, they haven't put good things in their hearts, or maybe other people haven't put good things into their heart. They haven't invested um, a lot of good. And so they have acted on the not good, unfortunately. And so let's go to James 1, 12 and 15 to go into this a little further. That's in the New Testament. And you can look at this later if you don't have your Bible, that's fine. I keep saying that because I know people are jumping in and out of this lesson and I don't want them to feel overwhelmed. Okay, James 1, 12 through 15 says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say that he is tempted. I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Okay, so God doesn't tempt you with evil and he doesn't tempt us with right or, or wrong. God always gives us good things, okay? But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lusts and enticed. When we are drawn away from the Lord, we are drawn away off of that path that he's had us on because of what we want to do in our own hearts. Remember, the heart is deceitful. It's hard to trust our hearts. When we hear out in the world or in the world and we say, follow your heart, we have to be very careful because we sometimes pick up wrong things as we live our life. And we're talking about the purpose of life, to know God. And part of that is letting go of our own ideas of who he is. Because he will tell us who he is. And sometimes I will, um, you know, I will see that within myself and realize that I'm doing this and this that's not good, making a bad choice because I've lost sight of who God said he is 
in his word and I am acting on who I think he is. Oh, God's okay with me doing this. God's okay with me saying this. God's okay with me reading this. God's okay with me watching this. But is he really? That's why a relationship with God is so important. And then it says, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Now this is very, very heavy. And I'm not going to camp at on this too much because we're talking about the purpose of life. But to, to talk about sin for a minute, we're just going to define it. Sin is anything that separates us from God. Simple. Um, simple, but not simple. Okay. It's anything that's going to be a divider in that relationship. Remember, he wants to be known. We are to know God. And so if there's something that's going to come in between you, in that relationship, that's called sin. Could be what we, you know, it could be um, how we choose to live our day, how we choose to um, look at a certain person or situation that might not be uh, pleasing to God or good. It's anything that creates a barrier between what we want to do and what we should do. So what is the best choice, right? Sin also causes issue between people. That's why we see the world the way that we see it. We ask the big question, why do bad things happen to good people? It's because of sin. It's because there's free will and people choose to make wrong choices because they don't have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with God where they allow God to check their hearts and to bring things to their attention so that they can deal with it. Instead, they just choose to do what they want to do and they don't mind uh, uh, hurting other people, unfortunately. Um, not everybody. Uh, but there are some people who are remorseful if they do something wrong. Um, but sin just causes issues between us on earth, which can result in damaging consequences. And sometimes those consequences have ripple effects that affect other people who weren't even involved. Okay, if you look at a family unit, okay, if you have two healthy parents and a healthy marriage, and then one day it's not healthy anymore. It's because maybe one of them had something in their heart that they weren't dealing with. And now it's affecting the entire family unit. It's that ripple effect, right? And so why do bad things happen to good people? Sometimes it's because the people who are making the wrong choices aren't thinking about anybody else but what they want to do. That's why when people say, follow your heart, what if, what's in somebody's heart is evil. We don't talk about that. What if what's in somebody's heart is to do harm to somebody else? These are legit real questions when we talk about the purpose of life. What if somebody has it in their heart to, to really um, cause harm and hurt and pain? So we have to be careful encouraging that because they might not have the right motive in their heart. Um, every person is tempted to do what they want, but every person has a free will to choose not to. You could do it or not, but God is not a controlling master. He's not going to make us do stuff. And um, I think a lot of people get confused by that, uh, but it's true. He doesn't want to control us um, like some people think. Um, he just knows all things. And if he knows all things, um, then when we follow him, then we know that we can trust him because he knows what is good for us and what is not. So right now, we are going to be wrapping this up soon, but right now we are experiencing the consequences of what happened in the Garden of Eden. And hopefully next week we can get deeper into that. But the Garden of Eden is when the first man and, and woman made the wrong choice. And most of us are familiar with this story and we'll unpack it as we go on but it affected their legacy it affected their kids and then it affected the kids kids and the kids 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 and so on and so on until we're here today um and there's evidence of that so if we go back um and we're almost done here but i want to revisit before we finish genesis 2 15 and 17 god warns us 
Well, he warned man in the garden. Um, and he says, you know, remember there's two trees, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shall not eat of it. Before that, in six, verse 16, he says, he says, of every tree, you can freely eat. You can eat any other tree, but this one tree you can't eat. And when you tell a child, even now, okay, here's all this candy, but you can't eat the red one. Guess which one the child wants to eat? <laughs> he wants to eat the red one, as you pointed out. Now, God's first instruction to the first man was to not eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Not only was he giving an instruction, he also revealed the consequence. And this is what uh, a lot of times we don't think about with God is that when we are in a relationship with God, he's going to tell you what's going to happen if you don't, if you, if you make certain choices. And he says, he says this, that if you eat of it, you're going to die. And, and he, his God's warnings are not hidden from us. Um, it is up to us to resist the temptation. We have that freedom to choose the right way. And I'm going to end on these three scriptures here. And then we will go in prayer. Matthew 26, 41. Okay, this is Jesus. He was uh he was praying and he says this to the disciples. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Remember, we are a living soul. And so we have we have that connection to the Lord, all of us, whether we obey him or not. And he is saying that that part of us, spirit, is willing to do good things, to watch and pray, to not enter into temptation. But our our flesh, the the other parts of us that's not connected spiritually to God, that's what's the weak part. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says this, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. Okay, so he's saying, just like in the garden, there is a way of escape. There's a temptation right there. Um, well. There's a tree of life. They could have eaten from the tree of life. Um, we just look at it in our lives. If we are tempted, we always have an option not to choose to give in. We always have that option. Sometimes we are so focused, it doesn't seem like we have that option because we're so focused on what we want to do. But that's our way of escape. God always provides a way of escape when we are tempted. And then let's end with 1 Timothy 6, 7 through 9. And it says, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. That's pretty bold of a statement, but it's true. When we came to this world, we were just a baby. We didn't even have clothes on. There's nothing that we showed up with, right? We didn't bring anything into this world. So when we are done, when our life is over, anything that we've accumulated, all this stuff doesn't matter. All the, th the numbers in your bank account doesn't matter. Anything else doesn't matter. We can't take it out. We can't, it can't come with us. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. That means whatever food is provided, whatever clothes we have, whatever we have that's in front of us, we need to be content with. We need to be okay with it. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare 
That means rich just means outside of your means or more than you, than, than what's the normal. There's a temptation there. There's a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. So it's just saying that when you're not content and you're focusing on being rich or having more, when you just focus on the more, there is a temptation there. There's a snare there. And it's not saying that you can't desire good things. It's not saying you can't have goals. It's not saying you can't be financially wealthy or anything like that. But it's just saying that there's going to come uh, an extra responsibility when you do have those things, when you do have more. When you have more, there's an extra responsibility and you're going to face temptation. And so I want to just encourage you to um, show up here next Thursday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time um, so we can dive into part five. We're actually going to go through the details of Genesis um, Genesis 2 and we're going to look at um, the how the Lord created woman. And we're going to talk about some of the relationship there. Uh, because if we're talking about the purpose of life, what about the purpose between man and the woman? And um, that's probably what's going to be next um, so that we can create a foundation for that relationship between Adam and Eve before the next chapter of Genesis 3, that is Eve being tempted um, by, the, by the serpent, which is going to be obviously... Um, the main part of of this portion of the study right now but um so i encourage you that if you would like these study notes to just send me a message on instagram at hello awesome live and i can send you the link um if you are on zoom now you can actually um get the the uh, if you go in the chat i have the study note link in there also, um, you can head to my Facebook group for this Bible study. It's the Purpose of Life Bible Study. I think I have it, P-O-L, Bible Study Group. And I can upload all the files there. So I do have the notes in there too. So there's different ways you can get the study notes. It's just so you can have the scriptures and all my talking points um, in this study, in this lesson today with you. So um So let us pray, and then I'm going to end the recording. Lord Jesus, I want to just first thank you for the opportunity to be able to read your word today. It is a blessing to me, and I know it's going to be a blessing to those out there. God, I know that there are a lot of people that are watching and listening who are new at this, that everything, what I'm saying might be foreign, um, some of the words might be overwhelming or just confusing. But God, you are not the author of confusion. And I know that you can make yourself known to them in a mighty way. So God, I know that you can individually make yourself known to every person who is listening. And so I pray, Lord God, whether it be by visions or audible or visual or whatever, Lord God, use whatever means necessary to make yourself known so that they know that they are not alone, that there is a purpose of life, that they do have hope, that they are loved, that they are chosen, hallelujah, and that they don't have to give in to the negativity of this world, but they can be renewed in their minds when they follow your will. I thank you, Lord, for your love, for giving us the opportunity to choose you every single day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, I'm going to stop this right now and stay tuned for next week.